It's finally here. A battle between my favorite two directors. Which one comes out on top until their next movie comes out and that inevitably changes? We're going to talk about it right now. What's up, Fleet fans? Welcome back to the channel. I'm giddy with excitement. Today we're talking my favorite two modern-day directors. That is Denis Villeneuve and Christopher Nolan. This is in honor of Oppenheimer. I wanted to wait until Dune 2, but that could be pushed. And I want to do this right now. And this is my second tier list battle. We did Mission Impossible versus John Wick last weekend, so you can check that out. And uh, I'm planning something else very special in August. But right now, this is uh, maybe the one that I was looking forward to the most. I was able to go back, rewatch the movies that I needed to rewatch. Some of them I've seen like 10 times. There are a lot of films on this list that are in my all time movies ranked list. So you're going to see a lot of praise for these two directors because they're my favorite two in the business, so it's a very top-heavy tier list. Apologies in advance. Just kidding, I'm not apologizing. And if you enjoy this very different style of tier list, the best way to support this video is by dropping that like down below and leaving a comment what's your favorite movies between these two directors and who comes out on top. Let's do it. And these two directors very similar in age. Denis is 55 years old, Christopher Nolan is 52, but Nolan had a span in the early 2000s where he made movie after movie after movie and Denis took a very lengthy break, in terms of directing at least, between his first two films and his third movie. And the quality difference between those three films is drastically different, in my opinion. So we're going to start with each director's first movie. And Denis kind of had two in a row. And that's where we're going to go. And these are films that not a lot of people have seen. So obviously we're not going to spend a ton of time here. But following 1998, it's Christopher Nolan's first movie, Black and White. Only a little over an hour, so it doesn't even feel feature length, but you can start to see the qualities on display that he brings in his later movies. I just don't know if this story overall is as interesting as his other more complex, I don't want to say convoluted, more complex films, even though the direction is there, and I think the ending of following is actually really good. We're following this writer as he's walking around the streets of London, and he seems to be following innocent strangers, and nothing drastic is coming of it until he encounters this mysterious character, and that's when things seem to become a bit more dangerous. Now, that idea is really interesting. Could it make for a two-hour movie? Probably not, but I believe Nolan nails the length of this film. And while the filmmaking techniques are on display, and I think the aesthetic here is beautiful, I just did not respond to hardly any of the characters in this movie. I could use the word annoying, but that may make it sound worse than it actually is. I just couldn't get invested in these characters, and I think his writing from this movie, well, it has a long way to go. Let's see what he does next. So I'm going to go following on the OK tier. I still think there's enough here to uh, slightly enjoy it. Next up, we're moving on over to the other side in Denis' first film, the same year, 1998, two legends beginning when I was three years old. Good Lord. This is August 32nd on Earth. There's no August 32nd, Denis. You sly dog. You have a model who escapes from this car accident. She's fine, but she decides that having a baby is the only way for her life to mean something. She asks her friend to get her pregnant. He's like, all right, I, I guess. And you have somewhat of a romantic comedy. That's what it feels like, or at least the closest you're ever going to get from this director. And, you know, watching this movie, which was very hard to find and get a hold of, by the way, you can't really see, unlike following for Nolan, you can't really see hardly anything that you see now from Denis as a director. It's a very strange choice for a movie. Now, was it uh, overall a complete misfire? Not necessarily. I do think the characters here are maybe a little more compelling than something like following. But the craft on display, it's fine, but it's not even remotely close to what you expect from Denis. So uh, for that, I was a little disappointed here. Yeah, that's right. I'm putting a Denis Villeneuve movie on the meh tear breaks my heart. Okay, so at this point, these two directors, they're on a very similar path in terms of releasing their movies, but quality-wise, I do think Nolan has the upper hand when we're talking the early 2000s, and we're starting with 2000. Denis Villeneuve's next movie is Maelstrom. And our main character here, she suffered through several horrible events, it seems, in a row. She gets drunk and she hits a man with her car. And while she can't remember anything, she learns that she was to blame for his death, and this is a, a much different movie than what his first film tackled, and this is where we start to finally feel Denis Villeneuve, the director that we know, come to life. 
While this film still has comedy within it, it's much more of a drama than August 32nd, and I do believe the characters are handled just a bit better in this movie. We're dealing with some really dark topics here. She's getting to a point in her life where she feels like she can't continue, but then she meets the son of the person that she killed, and everything... Uh, well, I want to say it goes off the rails, but it becomes a much different movie at that point. It still doesn't quite have the quality of what we know to need to have. And while the filmmaking itself here is better than his first movie, I do believe his first movie is a bit more authentic as this feels like a film that I've just seen countless times and it doesn't stand out in terms of story. So again, as much as I love Denis, I, I have to put this movie on the meh tier. It just, it hasn't quite worked at this point. But we move over to the Nolan side of things in 2000 and this is a much different set of circumstances because Memento is Nolan's second movie and my God, does he not just elevate on what he did in following? He outdoes himself in this film. It is a phenomenal script. Now, it's not a movie. But when you watch the first time, not knowing anything about it, that you're going to completely comprehend, especially if you don't know the distinction between the scenes in color, the scenes in black and white, how this movie works, how it's building in a very different direction than what we are used to. And uh, the performances here, they're just so, they're so different. You know, rewatching this film, again, it just continues to elevate in my mind in terms of quality. Now, it's not the most emotionally captivating Christopher Nolan film, and it doesn't have that moment that you remember back to, you're like, yeah, Interstellar has this, Inception has this, Oppenheimer, oh my god, these scenes, right? Memento, it's a slow and steady build to an end result that is just a fascinating character study, and Guy Pierce absolutely nails it. Now, the whole cast is good. Carrie Ann Moss is great. Teddy is a great character, especially at the beginning when you don't really know his role, and the Sammy Jenkins story, right, the first time I'm watching Memento, I'm like, what does this fully, I mean, I understand what he's explaining to us, but how does it all come together and then you get that huge twist at the end and not to spoil it even though the movie's 23 years old come on! it definitely isn't the most entertaining nolan film and it is one that i think you're going to be a little frustrated with the first few times when you watch it and some will not watch it a second time because they're so frustrated the first time and i i don't want to say i can't blame them but it's a film that's just so creative I absolutely love Memento, and I've loved it more every time I've watched it. I'm putting Memento on the awesome tier early in Nolan's career. Next up, two years later, Nolan goes from a smaller budgeted movie to a bit of a bigger budget and some major stars with Al Pacino and Robin Williams. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Ha! And something tragic happens at the beginning of this film that Will Dormer, he's there firsthand. He witnesses this and it's eating him alive throughout the movie. So it's a great character study in that way. Pacino is incredible. And frankly, I think we get two of the best performances we've ever seen in a Nolan film in Insomnia. On the other side of things, you have Robin Williams who watches Will commit this act. Walter is dealing with his own demons. Some might say those demons are significantly worse than what Will is going through, but there's this understanding but also misunderstanding of what both characters are dealing with, and the back and forth between the two, it's phenomenal. Rewatching Insomnia, I mean, it really gave me a perspective of how Nolan was able to handle both of these characters, but also deliver a compelling and well-paced movie that does story-wise fall into cliche territory when we start talking about the other characters and the way these clues are uncovered and not getting the answers necessarily behind some of those things or filling in the gaps, which I think Nolan struggles to do with this movie, which is funny because Memento, that's a script that excels in filling in the gaps, whereas Insomnia is kind of the other side of the coin for me. I just don't think the story is nearly as strong as the performances and it does kind of fall into cliche territory at the end. The way it plays out, it's predictable. And I don't know if the ending is fully satisfying here. I'm kind of left going, oh, okay, well, that just kind of ended. But at the same time, I do think these two arcs are really phenomenal. Robin Williams, I mean, my God, he's just... I love this type of performance from him. Obviously, Pacino's going to crush it. So I do think Insomnia is a good movie, but maybe I expected better. And then in 2005, three years later, we're sticking with Christopher Nolan here. He goes from insomnia to, uh, you know what, let's just do Batman, because I can do anything at this point, so why not? <laughs> and I've talked about this trilogy a thousand times. I don't need to sit and harp on it once again. What he brought to this trilogy was unlike anything I expected as a 10-year-old, and all I knew was Joel Schumacher's Batman, the Batman from the comics, uh, you know, Justice League, Justice League Unlimited. So when I see this, I'm like, that's scary. Killian Murphy's Scarecrow is scary. 
It's dark, it's edgy, it kind of started to change comic book movies for the better, in my opinion, and it grounded the character of Batman, who, up until that point, had some grounded elements to him, especially in Batman the Animated Series, but we had never seen it on the big screen on that level. And I really love what Nolan did in this first film. My only big flaw, and I always say this, uh, Katie Holmes, her performance, is just, it's not the best as Rachel. That may have been the line delivery, the way that Nolan handled that specific character. It just didn't really work for me. But everything else about this movie, from Scarecrow to Liam Neeson's presence, his performance, and obviously what Bale brings to the character, this is the best Bale as Bruce Wayne performance out of the whole trilogy. And we're getting to see this origin retold in a very different way. Commissioner Gordon is great. I guess the story is a little generic on its surface. And like I said, not every performance works, but I'm putting Batman Begins on the awesome tier. In 2006, one year later, I mean, Nolan's just, he's firing on all cylinders at this point. He's back with the prestige and evil nub. Where you at, buddy? Uh, because Nolan brings yet another banger with this film. And it's one of the more underlooked at, underrated Nolan movies because we're always talking about Inception, Interstellar, and Batman, and the prestige is like, hey... I'm here, Hugh Jackman, Christian Bell, an inventive story about two magicians that hate each other because they're stealing each other's ideas, but there's also this underlying sense of obsession and jealousy and the deceitfulness between the two and what they continue to do to each other, involving each other's families and their livelihoods, and, and it's just an incredible showcase of acting. Once again, going back through these Nolan films, I'm like, I, I love the performances in these movies, and I never look at Nolan that way. I'm always like, oh, on a technical level, his movies, but Prestige is another acting showcase. Jackman is amazing. Christian Bale, what he has to do at certain points in this film, I'm like, yeah, he's great there, and he's great there, and it, should I just, I want to talk about the plot. It came out in 2006. There's two Christian Bales in this movie. Why have you not seen it? <laughs> it's the second film in the Christopher Nolan Mike O'Kane renaissance. Mike O'Kane. Really great supporting performances here and some tragedies that strike in this movie in some moments where our lead actors, they're having to uh, showcase pain and agony. And I love that. Also, the setting, the way that Nolan deals with this time period and implements some sci-fi into this magic-filled story that works, that flows seamlessly. Now, there are moments with the voiceover and the exposition that are a bit on the nose, and The Prestige doesn't have the best pacing I've seen in a Nolan movie. I think it works for what it's going for, but you get something regarding this storyline and these characters this time period. The pacing isn't going to be perfect. That being said, The Prestige is still, I mean, my God, Christopher Nolan. It's an awesome movie. Also, I just realized I didn't change the poster, so here you go. There it is. Look at that. You can't even can't even see it. What is that? What is that? It's time to add in the all-time tier. You knew this was coming. You didn't see that coming. Because we have made our way to 2008. Two years later, Nolan is he's on fire. We can't put out the fire. McCarthy, Richard Nixon, Studebaker, Television, North Korea, South Korea, Maryland, Monroe. It's the Dark Knight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's Nolan's ultimate showcase. It's a comic book movie for the ages. Everything about it, it, it flows so well. The pacing is amazing. It's a slower moving comic book movie, one of the first of its kind, but it still has impeccable pacing. The performances are amazing. Heath Ledger's Oscar winning turn. It is such a shame, rest in peace, that we lost him that soon. Everyone's good in this movie. Aaron Eckhart gives an underrated performance. Uh, Christian Bale is great. Now, you know, the complaint, common complaint about this film is that he's left in the shadows. Because <laughs> he's, he's Batman. While Heath Ledger gets the spotlight, that's fine. It works. What is there to complain about? My God, and he only gets 20 minutes of screen time. I needed an hour with this version of the Joker. He's amazing in this movie. And this world that Nolan has sculpted but elevates it with The Dark Knight, much more intriguing, interesting. The behind the scenes with these cops, the crime and Gotham, all of this coming together. A little bit of comic book love and glory in there. But really, it's just, it's an all-time comic book movie. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. And that's why I created an all-time tier for it. Now, a little bit of hate coming lately on TikTok. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the 
14 year olds that weren't in their prime during when the movie came. And maybe that's how people feel about me that love the Michael Keaton Batman. They're like, Austin, you don't get it. I like that movie. They're like, you don't get it. Why do you think the Dark Knight's better than that? That's that possibly is how I'm starting to feel about <laughs> that generation. But it's not all of you. It's only a certain group on TikTok. And it's so annoying because I'm just like, what are you complaining about? What is wrong with you? I don't get it. Now, if you think it's overrated, that's one thing. It may even be overrated in terms of its scores and all of it. Not to me, but to other people. But I'm talking about comments in certain videos I've made. People saying it's a bad movie. And I'm like, if you think this is a bad movie, I don't trust your judgment and I don't get it. So what's the problem? <laughs> bad, but the Dark Knight, that whatever it is, goes on the all-time tier. Duh. Well, look who it is. It's Denis Villeneuve. He's back with Polytechnique, a film that came out in 2009. And frankly... I was unaware of this until about four years ago when I did my original Denis tier list. And this is a tragic film. Do not watch this if you are, uh, you know, not willing to see what the summary tells you you are going to see because it is showed to us and told to us in a fairly graphic way. And Denis is handling material here that is so drastically different from his last two movies, his first two movies. This is when we start to see this director come to light and really elevate his game, elevate uh, his material. But the material is based on the true story. It's a dramatization of the Montreal Massacre, where several female engineering students were murdered by an unstable misogynist. And we see it. And it happens on screen. It's devastating. It's heartbreaking. It's a black and white movie. The performances are astounding, but my God, this is a tragic movie. And frankly, it's a movie that I never want to watch again. I did not rewatch this. I just kept my thoughts intact from the last time because this is a hard, hard movie to watch and it's, it will make you tear up. I do understand some of the criticisms of this film. It's a very grim style handling a grim topic and subject, but he brings this darkness to it that may rub some people the wrong way. And at the end, you know, after all of these tragic things happen, you get this sense of empathy, but does it feel earned or not? I'm not necessarily sure, but I do think the, the filmmaking here and the way that he handles this material while some would say cruel at times, it does get its message across fairly clearly. And I do think Villeneuve's heart at least was in the right place when making this movie because he wants to show these tragic events, hopefully, so history doesn't repeat itself. Now, it does repeat itself, unfortunately, fairly often, especially in the United States. But this is one of those movies that should serve as a warning. I'm going to put this on the good tier. I don't believe it's great, but uh, it's worth a watch if you can handle it. At this point, Christopher Nolan is the clear winner of this challenge. Now, he's had more movies, so is it fair? Not necessarily, but he keeps his streak alive in 2010. He goes from The Dark Knight to Inception. Prestige, Dark Knight, Inception. One of the greatest three movie runs of all time. It's ridiculous. I don't just love this movie because I was so confused the first time I watched it and I walked out going, cinema, what the f is this? Part of that's on me because I was 15 when this movie came out. But the other part of it is going back and rewatching this movie, a movie that I want to rewatch because it's so immensely entertaining and thrilling and you're on the edge of your seat and the different layers of the dreams and all of the characters played by amazing actors. It's like 13 years later, I'm still happy to rewatch Inception because it's just that kind of movie, man. It's an action thriller showcase, a spectacle, a layered film, a movie with ideas and thoughts that may not always come together and connect perfectly, but it doesn't matter because Nolan went for it, but he went for it in the best way, and I think these characters are really, really good, and Leonardo DiCaprio, I mean, he got Leo in this film, and he's great. You have a young Joseph Gordon-Levitt at the beginning of his run with a young Tom Hardy. I mean, all of these characters that are so great and they, they join Dom on this journey through dreams and the dreams are just, they come to life in the most beautiful way, utilizing amazing set pieces, brilliant cinematography, and this cinematic look to it that frankly was not replicated for years after that. Obviously the ending, a lot of people were like, oh, was he in a dream? Was he not in a dream 13 years later? We're still wondering the same thing. Does it matter as long as he found happiness as a character? This is an all time inventive, creative, and bafflingly gorgeous movie. I'm going all time. Come on, Christopher Nolan. 2010, same year as Inception, Denis Villeneuve finally, finally does not just hit the mark, exceeds the mark in his best movie yet, a film that 
not a lot of, still the more general public they haven't seen this film and they haven't experienced the heartbreak the emotion the tragedy of Enson D and I think that's I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it <laughs> I'm just saying. We have our two main characters. When they hear their mother's last wish, they go on this journey to the Middle East in search of their roots. Our two young characters, they're on this voyage that probably split your heart in two. This is a disturbing movie in the same vein, well, a similar vein as Polytechnique, but it goes in a very different direction. Uh, and thankfully, some of these tragic moments, they're more spread out than that film to where you can at least stomach them a bit more as you're watching. Uh, but the way that he directs this film, these characters, uh, and the ending, the tragic ending to this movie, and I'm trying to tiptoe around what this film is actually about, uh, but it's showcasing war in a very different way than I had ever seen before watching this movie. Uh, and then after it gave me a new perspective of how something like a story like this could be told. Because frankly, I have never seen anything like it. It's a gripping film that doesn't quite have those cinematic moments uh, that he has in his movies post and Sondi. But this one, it's telling a story that you can't, you don't quite need that in a film like this. So that's okay. But at the same time, these characters, these performances, and uh, the way that it all plays out, it's going to work for a lot of people. Others, they may not be able to handle it. But. I believe this is an awesome movie, one of the best of that year, and one that everyone should seek out if they're a fan of his. All right, so we finally got a banger from Denis. We're going to go back to Nolan. Nolan, what do you got for me? Well, it's the sequel to The Dark Knight in 2012, right? Yes, the fire rises. I was born in the dark, molded by it. I didn't see the light until I was a younger man, and by then it was blood. Is The Dark Knight Rises as cohesive of a story as The Dark Knight? No. Does it pack the punch that The Dark Knight does? At times, on a cinematic scale, yes. It's a massive movie with massive set pieces. The battle at the end is great. Some of the lines between Batman and Bane uh, towards the end of the movie are like, oh, okay, it's a little cheesy, but it's a comic book movie, and I feel like Nolan embraces that a bit more in this film compared to the first two movies. You know, all of that being said, the story's not as strong. That's very clear, and there are some things that just aren't really focused on at the end. It's like, would they would have died from nuclear fallout, maybe? I don't know. Then obviously Marion Cotillard's death, but she's good. I think Anne Hathaway's good in this. She's not my favorite Catwoman. Gary Oldman, this may be his best performance as Commissioner Gordon. And again, you have Christian Bale going up against Tom Hardy. I mean, that's the best, and it works out very well. And yes, I have my nitpicks, but this movie impacts me on a different level than other people, maybe? But you know what? I'm going to put The Dark Knight Rises on the great tier. And I've actually been sitting and pondering on one decision that I made earlier, and that's putting Batman Begins on the awesome tier because I feel as if The Dark Knight Rises and Batman Begins, it's a lot closer than people give it credit for. And I do have some nitpicks that's making me rethink putting Batman Begins on the awesome tier. This is not a detriment towards the movie, but because they are so close and because I I've just been thinking about it, I'm going to put... Uh, Batman begins right next to The Dark Knight Rises. All right, so far, frankly, it's been Christopher Nolan, no competition. He's going to win this war if it ends right now, but uh, 2012 is not the last year in our history. 2013 comes along, and you get two movies from Denis Villeneuve. One, Prisoners, two, Enemy, back-to-back, -back, two Jake Gyllenhaal performances. Let's start with one of my favorite movies of all time. And I may be spoiling myself here, but Prisoners impacted me on a level that I never imagined it would. Watching it for the first time, unfortunately, I did not get to see it in the theater, but I did get to see it in a setting to where I was by myself. I just got to focus on the characters, the tragedy of the situation, a man who will do anything it takes to get his daughter back, and a problem that's a legitimate thing Kids get taken all of the time. Now that I'm a dad, it's even more heartbreaking than it was. And uh, this movie is so impactful. It's more of a horror movie than <laughs> any horror movie you could watch because it's a true type of horror. And uh, you have one of the more stacked casts of that year. Jackman, Gyllenhaal, Terrence Howard, Viola freaking Davis is phenomenal in this movie. Paul Dano, why was this? I don't get it. I don't get why Prisoners was not only snubbed from some major awards, but Hugh Jackman wasn't rewarded with the nomination. Jake Gyllenhaal, his character, his performance as this character, it's so different than anything we had seen before. I just, I love the way this 
cast handles this material. The script in Prisoners is one of the best scripts Denia's ever had, and the way that he executes this, the visuals and the visceral nature of what we're dealing with here, the twists and turns, laid out like a mystery, solving a literal puzzle as we're going. And we are just as clueless as Jackman's character in this movie, but we're just as heartbroken as everyone involved. And I've never seen a film that's made me feel this way about the bad characters in a movie. And Denis, I mean, it's masterful. It's masterful filmmaking, man. If you've never seen Prisoners, everything about it's perfect. I mean, it's, it's perfect. It was perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty obvious this is an all-timer. Uh, duh. Shortly after Prisoners, I guess he saw Jake Gyllenhaal and said, I, I, let's do another one because that was great. So let's see what you can do with this script, this very uh, different, maybe the most different story of all of these movies, and that is Enemy. This was in the early days of A24. It's all about a college professor who discovers that there's a lookalike actor, and uh, each man dives into the other person's affairs, and it gets pretty deep. While Hall does a nice job of distinguishing himself, one performance is very different from the other, and uh, both individuals, their lives are drastically different, but when they decide to infiltrate each other's lives, that's when you start to, I mean, the lines are blurred on a level to where it becomes a little difficult the first time you're watching it. And it's also a little more difficult than I believe Denis wanted it to be when it comes to grasping and understanding the themes that this story is tackling and really what it's going for overall. A lot of people look at this ending and they say, well, it's just not, I wasn't satisfied. What does that, no, what's the metaphor here? I mean, you know the ending of this movie, right? It's terrifying. But like Denis and Nolan's other movies, the more I watch Enemy, the more I, I start to really resonate with this story and the climactic moments of this movie upon rewatch. They've meant so much more than they did the first time. I'll be honest with you guys. I watched this movie for the first time and I'm like, I just don't understand the hype. It's a hyped up film for the most part. I mean, I believe putting the puzzle pieces together on what this film actually means is even more interesting than watching it. So is that good or bad for the? I don't know, but I know Jake Gyllenhaal, he is amazing in this movie. Melanie Laurent, she's great. And I am going to put Enemy on the great tier. I think this is a great film. All right, we go from 2013, the year of Denis Villeneuve, to 2014. Once again, the year of Christopher Nolan, one of my most hyped movies of all time. I'm like, Nolan, the guy who did Batman and the guy who did Inception, he's doing a sci-fi epic with Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right. I was really looking forward to this movie. I thought it could blow me away, and it did. Well, not as much at the time, but over time. Over time. Over time! Like all great directors do, it's one that when you watch it again, you understand more the nuances of it all. And not that it was super confusing at the beginning, but just like Inception, you know, you get to that end and everything that's happening behind the scenes, what was her ghost, what does that actually mean, what actually solved the problem here. I think Nolan takes a leap, uh, a very silly leap on its surface. Love is the answer, baby. <laughs> but it actually works within the confines of what this movie is, and, you know, he takes science into account all throughout the film, but, you know, taking one of those jumps that's not going to work for everyone, in my opinion, is the right move with a film like this, and I didn't quite understand that the first time I watched. I thought the movie was great, but I did not think it would resonate like it did for weeks and then watching it again and again and again until they're all dead. Again and again and again until we're both dead. But good lord McConaughey in those scenes where he sees that his children have aged 20, 30 years and the devastation in his eyes. I think Anne Hathaway is really good. Marco Kane is really good in this movie. Uh, some of those emotional performances and Mackenzie Foy, uh, Casey Affleck, Timothy Chalamet's in this movie as a young Casey Affleck and it actually, it's perfect. It's so weird that it's perfect. But Jessica Chastain, this is one of her better performances. She's not talked about like McConaughey from this film, but she should be. She is great in Interstellar and the emotional payoff, the way that this movie wraps up. Hans Zimmer, what was, what were you on while writing the score for this movie? It's, one of the best scores of all time, and the guy on the piano, I mean, just, come on. All right, I'm done being stupid. This is going on the all-time tier, duh. And now we go to 2015, one of the greatest crime thrillers of all time. That is Sicario, shining a light on this war, this drug war that is escalating all throughout this movie between the United States and Mexico, taking place at the border. That first scene with Emily Blunt, it is uh, bone-chilling, it's mind-boggling the way that it starts out, and it never lets up. Its foot never leaves that gas pedal, man. You are on this 
intense edge of your seat journey from start to finish. That being said, my one issue with this movie is occasionally the pacing lightens up and you're not as invested as you were at the beginning, or it's not as interesting as it could be, but the performances they make up for that. Emily Blunt, this is a magnificent lead performance. Benicio Del Toro, one of my favorite performances ever in a crime thriller, maybe his best performance ever, that dynamic or lack thereof between he and Josh Brolin, Daniel Kaluuya, John Bernthal, his cast is amazing, but it's also this true, real, grounded story, and it feels like you're watching a documentary at times, but the action is riveting, there isn't all that much of it, you're much more invested in the conversations, but sometimes that's the best type of movie. Sicario, while I wouldn't say... It's in his top three. I would say this is an awesome movie, and I will not blame you if you put this in his top three. All right, this is getting ridiculous. 2016, another year of Denis Villeneuve without Christopher Nolan, and another year he is getting stronger. I can feel your anger. We got Interstellar from Christopher Nolan. We got Arrival from Denis Villeneuve. Two sci-fi masterworks, in my opinion. But this is very different. This is much more grounded. It's not taking place in the too far distant future. Uh, we're dealing with how we communicate, really, with each other, but also life that is not on Earth. These are aliens that come in. And I think back to that first scene in Arrival when she's teaching and then everyone's just kind of running out and the world has been invaded. But it's not a classic sci-fi action movie type of invasion. It's so ground. It feels like this could have actually happened, and it's some of the best filmmaking of Denis Villeneuve's career. He's really mastered his craft at this point. The cinematography is amazing. Johan Johansson's score, I keep talking about the music in all of these movies, but this is genuinely my top five scores of all time. I go back to it so much. This and Interstellar are both in my top five, but I go back to this so much, and to live in that moment with these characters is something else. It's just, I've never quite experienced a movie like this but like interstellar we have an emotional core to this movie revolving around her daughter that is um it's handled expertly and i've always thought this movie was uh, amazing close to a 10 out of 10 but it's really taken me years to fully appreciate it on a level that i didn't quite understand at the time especially now that i have more of a connection with the lead character because i have a daughter uh, but also the relationship between amy adams who should have an Oscar, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a win. Maybe a win for this performance. I don't know. But should have a nomination under her belt for this movie. But that relationship between she and Jeremy Renner is so good in this film. So underrated, so under-talked about. And Forrest Whitaker is great. And I don't really have an issue with the rival. Occasionally the pacing, but that's it doesn't matter. I'm putting a rival. Oh my God. God on the old time tier. Next up, we're back to Christopher Nolan. 2017, a good year for movies, and he's directing a war feature? I'm sorry, what? Based around World War I? You, you have my attention. Great cast, Mark Rylance, Tom Hardy, Kenneth Branagh, Killian Murphy, Barry Keoghan. I believe there are some things that get in the way of Dunkirk being on that, you know, all-time Christopher Nolan tier because he tries so hard to implement that slightly complex in his mind, maybe convoluted in our mind type of story with what should have been a more simplistic war movie, in my opinion, that gets in the way of Dunkirk really working because the filmmaking here is immaculate. I will never forget my experience of watching Dunkirk on the big screen with that score, with that cinematography, some standout scenes. Dunkirk is not without two or three scenes that stand out as some of the better directed war scenes of all time. And I mean that. I genuinely do. But he goes for this three storylines happening at the same time. They're all three happening at different times, but we are watching them in a way to where it's not as coherent as it needs to be, and it's not playing out in the way that, frankly, it should have to keep more general audience goers invested, and that's fine if he's trying to be complex here, but it just feels like a story like this doesn't warrant that, it doesn't need it, and while I enjoy this, really enjoyed it my first time, I'm like, I just don't know, I don't know if that was necessary, and the more I watch Dunkirk, the more I feel like it wasn't necessary. That being said, because it's so perfect on a technical level and it may be one of Hans Zimmer's greatest scores ever, which is hard to top, interstellar, and Hoyt van Hoytema is uh, amazing, I am still going to put this on... 
I want to put it on the good tier. I do think great is maybe a little strong, but I think it's really high good tier, almost great. Same year, Denis Villeneuve, a uh, highly anticipated sequel. He's doing a sequel to a movie that he didn't do. It's kind of like, why would you do this? Why would you take on this as your project? You can't possibly top the original Blade Runner, Denis. And he does. It's very apparent that he loves sci-fi. It's very apparent he's going to stay in that world for a while because we still have Dune 2, maybe Dune 3. Uh, but Blade Runner 2049 is not only one of the best sequels ever made, it surpasses the original. That's right. I said it in almost every way. Now, granted, I didn't grow up with Blade Runner. It's not one that meant a lot to me as a youngin, okay? I first watched it when I was a little older. I really appreciated it, but I wasn't as invested as a lot of people say that they are. I think it's a really good movie, but um, I look at this sequel, and it not only capitalizes on what the first did well, but it advances every idea on a level that I never thought it could for Blade Runner 2049, and it's not just a visual, visceral masterpiece with amazing production design, a beautiful setting, a crazy sci-fi world that takes advantage of this neon look and, you know, just delivers in every way on a visual level. I mean, this is some of the best color grading I've ever seen in a movie, ever. Roger Deakins' cinematography is iconic at this point. And, oh, uh, look who it is. It's Hans Zimmer again. Ryan Gosling is K, who is stoic, but in a way that fits his character because of what he is. And when he finally shows emotion, it's amazing. And then Harrison Ford, who really showed up. I mean, he showed up and showed out in this movie. The way it wraps up, the beautiful ending, the unraveling of the mystery inside of the sci-fi, inside of this world, it's all so masterful. I feel like I'm hyping up these directors on a ridiculous level, but I don't care. Blade Runner, all-time tier. This is getting old. Tenet, one of my most hyped Christopher Nolan movies. I keep saying this, but Nolan's on that level now as a director, and I'm like, what's he going to do? We're back in the sci-fi world. Is it going to be crazy? Is it going to be convoluted? Are you going to top what you did in Inception? John David Washington, Robert Pattinson, who else? Aaron Taylor Johnson, yeah. Tenet is entertaining. It features an amazing score by Ludwig Gornson. Uh, the cinematography is great. The fight sequences are so cool. There were times where it's like it's so hard to capture what they're doing. Moving forward through time, moving backward, and fighting each other, right? That's a very difficult thing to pull off. And with Nolan, he likes to do a lot of things practically. Couldn't do it all in this movie practically, but most of the time, it looks really good. There are some sound mixing issues with this film that I noticed when I watched it in the theater, but I watched it in a great theater with good speakers, so it didn't really bother me that much the first time. Second, third times, I'm like, okay, there are some issues here. And Tenet is interesting because I liked it when I first watched it, started to kind of like, okay, this is a little too much, it's a little overly convoluted, and I've gravitated a bit back towards it as time has moved on because... After a lot of research, I think I understand the movie now, but it took a lot. And that shouldn't be the case, especially for a general audience goer who's going to watch it once and be like, why would I watch that again? It's too confusing. <laughs> it has too many ideas at play and nothing's really going for it at certain moments in the movie when it needs all of the momentum in the world to keep you on board and invested. And because of that, these really pivotal action scenes... They don't hold the same weight if you're trying to figure out what's going on. Not just piecing together puzzle pieces. You're confused. I am so confused. And that's an issue. All of that being said, I still enjoy Tenet. I like the intrigue of it. I like the idea of it now that I kind of grasp what's going on. And it's super entertaining. I think that action sequence and score combination all throughout this film it makes for a really cool experience. And... I would like to see this one in the theater again. Right now, I'm going to put it on the good tier, but uh, who knows? A couple years down the road. All right, we've entered Dune. This was one of my most anticipated movies ever. I was hyped out of my mind. The trailer riveted me. It captivated me. Timothy Chalamet, Jason Momoa, Josh Brolin, the cast is stacked. It's like Denis just took all of the people that he likes and has worked for and the cinematographer and Hans Zimmer and he said, you guys come together and create just this epic experience. Now, Dune is a slower moving movie than I wanted or I thought it would be. Don't know why I thought it would move quicker because the book is the same way, but it does move a little slow and I think the pacing can be its detriment at times and it didn't make for the most captivating experience out of the rest of his filmography. For me, this doesn't have the same impact as a Blade Runner or as an Arrival. 
All of that being said, we are building and leading up to something, in my opinion, that could be even greater with Dune Part 2. And please don't delay it, please. They captured something that I, I never thought they would capture. This book? I have the book. Here's the book. It's a lot. It's a lot of book. And it's not just a lot of book. I mean, that's a good size book, right? No, it has its own freaking dictionary. The words and the phrases and the worlds and the ideas and the concepts and what it stands for and, and what Paul's journey entails and what it's going to entail and what it's leading up to and, and blah, 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 blah. I have pacing issues with Dune and I don't hate the fact that it just leaves off and you're ready for part two. I hate where it ends. I think if it would have left off about 10 to 15 minutes earlier, it would have been a more captivating ending and we could have saved that for Dune part two. That's my issue with the ending. But capturing what he needed to capture in the unmakeable sci-fi story, my God, he did it. He captured it. I still can't believe he was able to do it, at least for part one. Let's see if he captures part two. But because of all of those things, I am going to put Dune on the awesome tier. Oppenheimer hasn't left my brain for five, six days now. I have been thinking about it consistently. And here's why it's sticking with me so much. I'm still in awe about the fact that Nolan made a movie this interesting, this intense, this well-paced for three hours, this well-edited about the life of a man who did something fascinating. Don't get me wrong. It's a fascinating set of circumstances, but it's a historical biopic that feels like a thrilling, at times, action movie. I saw somebody on Twitter, he's like, wow, there was no action in Oppenheimer. That being said, it's paced like that type of movie. The editing is masterful. And I have to bring up her name, Jennifer Lame. She's an editor working on movies like Hereditary, Marriage Story, Tenet, Wakanda Forever, Manchester by the Sea, uh, The Merowitz Stories. This is one of my favorite editors in the business. She is a star of Oppenheimer, in my opinion, just as much as anyone in that cast. And her, you know, ability to weave this story so beautifully, combined with Nolan's direction, combined with Hoyt van Hoytema's cinematography, Ludwig Gornson's best score yet, Robert Downey Jr.'s best performance ever. I would put this above anything else, but some standout performances that, yes, Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, RDJ, they're all going to get Oscar nominations, but Matt Damon is great. Florence Pugh is great. Benny Safdie, Josh Hartnett, Kenneth Branagh, Alden Ehrenreich was amazing, and Jason freaking Clark owned his scenes. He was phenomenal in his scenes, and I say all of that looking at Nolan like, yeah, he's always looked at as a director that creates technical masterpieces, but this is an acting masterpiece. This is a screenplay that it's going to go down as one of the best of this year, one of the best, maybe the best of Nolan's career. It's like he's doing all of the things he always does amazing, but now he's elevating his storytelling and his ability to, you know, bring in the actors and allow them to work off of each other so beautifully. It's it may be his best directed movie. Now, is it the most engaging? Is it my favorite? You know, I'm a big fan of fictional storytelling. I love sci-fi. I love superheroes. I guess it all comes down to what happens upon rewatch. Do I still have my pacing issues in the first 20 minutes? Are the final 30 minutes, do they feel as tacked on as they did the first time? I still really enjoyed them, but yeah, after 2 hours and 30 minutes and the movie ends and then you have 30 more minutes, it's kind of like, was that fully necessary? It depends on how that hits me the second time around, but Oppenheimer could be moving up this list uh, very soon. For now, I'm going to put it on the awesome tier. I feel pretty good about it, but uh, we'll see. Before I get into my ranking portion, how do you feel about this list? How would you rank their movies? What's your top five between both? And uh, I'm going to give you my decision, but who is your favorite director out of the two? At the bottom, they don't have a bad movie or an awful movie. That's great. But on the mad tier, I'm going to leave Maelstrom at the bottom because I slightly prefer August 32nd on Earth. On the OK tier, obviously it's following. But then we have the good tier, and this is where it becomes a little more difficult. I am going Insomnia, nothing against it, at the bottom, and slightly above that Polytechnique. Between Dunkirk and Tenet, which one would I rather rewatch? Probably Tenet. I don't ever have the urge to rewatch Dunkirk, even though it's masterful, but with those story issues, I mean, it's just a toss-up, but I'm going to surprise a lot of people 
and put Dunkirk lower than 10. I know, man. I know. On the great tier, it's Enemy at the bottom, and I always go back and forth between The Dark Knight Rises and Batman Begins. Today, we'll put Batman Begins right above that, but it could be either or. On the awesome tier, as much as I love Sicario, I have to go Sicario, followed by... You know what? I'm going Dune above Sicario, and I'm going The Prestige above Dune, which is surprising even me. Next up, it's a masterful film in Incendie, and then uh, let's go Oppenheimer above Memento. Come on, buddy. There we go. Because Oppenheimer has a good chance to move even higher uh, after another watch. Now, I I'm having some difficulty with these movies, but let's keep Blade Runner right where it is and follow that up with Interstellar Murph. Above Interstellar is Prisoners. Prisoners is a phenomenal film. But is it as phenomenal as Inception? But we're going Inception right above that. Yeah, my number two, we're staying with Arrival. Again, I believe Arrival is just, it's almost the perfect, no, I think it is the perfect sci-fi movie. It's everything I've ever wanted in a sci-fi film, so it's one of my all-time favorites. Number one, it's very generic, it's very cliche, but being a comic book movie fan like I am, uh, and loving Batman like I do, I think that is just like the ultimate movie for me, but um, we have to make a decision. So we're going to throw out the fact that it's 12 movies versus 10, but we do have to look at the idea of Denis Villeneuve having the two worst films on this list, and Nolan having my number one. One. So that's a lot in favor of Nolan. On my all-time tier, we have three Nolan and three Denis movies, and they're almost one after another. On the awesome tier, it's the same thing. Three versus three, but once again, I'm seeing a trend here. Nolan is on top of the awesome tier. It's two versus one, with both Batman movies being above enemy. And on the good tier, I have the Nolan film. You know what? I think... I have said for three years that Denis Villeneuve is my favorite director in Hollywood, and I stand by that to a degree, but it looks like it's 1A, 1B for me, and it looks like Christopher Nolan, and the movie that may have done it is Oppenheimer, because on that awesome tier, now it's three versus three, whereas it was uh, in favor of Denis Villeneuve, but again, the trend for me on this list is apparent, and now that I see it, I think I have to pivot in who I thought was going to win this. I thought Denis would come away victorious. Maybe Oppenheimer gives Nolan the edge. It may be his best directed movie. I'm going Christopher Nolan with the victory. He is now my 1A director working right now. Denis is 1B. Uh, David Fincher is probably 1C, maybe. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you alone. This is the longest video I may have ever done. Thanks so much for watching. Leave those comments. Leave those likes. I'll come back with another one of these. Pitch your ideas down below. Which verses should we do next? See you soon.